This is Thomas Keegan with LibertarianProgressive.com. We interview independent and third-party candidates who are running for Congress and other offices who are the only third-party options in their area. There's more going on this November 8th than just the presidential elections. We believe Congress, a co-equal branch of government, deserves co-equal media coverage. Today we're interviewing Rudy Barnes candidates from the American Party in South Carolina. He's running for Congress for his district number five. So let's give him a call and start this interview. Hello, Rudy Barnes. Rudy, good to talk to you today. This is Thomas Keegan with LibertarianProgressive.com. And, good, uh, good to hear you, Thomas. Yes, Rudy. Nice to hear your voice, sir. Nice to see that we have um, in District Number Five in South Carolina an alternate choice for the people besides Republican and Democrat. And to my understanding, Amen. That's that's why I'm running, Thomas, to give to give voters that alternate choice. And you're the only third party option in your district. In our district, right? Don't have any Libertarians, or Green Party people, or Constitution Party people running uh, at this end. I'm, I'm it. For this go around have you been in any debates or are there any debates coming up uh, not formal debates but there have been some interviews there have been some candidate forums where we've made little talks and uh but not formal debates no okay now people can get more information at rudy barnes for congress.com that's r-u-d-y-b-a-r-n-e-s for congress.com rudy barnes for congress.com correct and, and i have also a, there's another related website <clears throat> that you can get to through that campaign web, website it's called religion legitimacy and politics where i have posted uh, some 24 uh, separate commentaries on issues that i think are important uh, uh, to this election Okay, oh, and Rudy, if you don't mind, we'd like to go through about seven issues and get your sure. quick answers on them. And okay. um, now I want to read first, one thing. You've got you've got the first the first one was what you began with. This, yeah. uh, you know, running in order to be an alternative to this two party duopoly, the choices that we have coming from them, uh, and and the mess that they've created uh, for us up in Washington is really the first priority and one that I want to make sure is, is put on top of the list. But, yeah, we, then we can go down to more conventional issues, I suspect. Absolutely, absolutely. I think Nelson Rockefeller is noted as saying competition is a sin, but we don't all agree with that. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it can be. It can be. True. Cooperation is often a little better than competition. And, frankly, you know, competition is healthy so long as it's kept within bounds. When it gets to the point of, as it has in, in Washington, to polarize, our, our two parties, so that they can't produce, can't you know, engage in compromise, then we've got a problem. Yeah, so it's how you compromise. I want to read one or two paragraphs from your website real quick, and we'll get to the questions. Yep. It, on your website, uh, RudyBarnesForCongress.com, it says the incumbent Republican uh, that you're running against supports Donald Trump and has sponsored legislation to benefit hedge funds on Wall Street. His Democrat opponent mm -hmm. is committed to the policies of president obama and hillary clinton for many of you the those choices are unacceptable so that kind of uh speaks to the issue of a uh, wall street uh let's say Correct. and that also can go into crony capitalism bailouts so right. that's the first issue i wanted to ask you about is crony capitalism uh you see that as a problem nowadays absolutely I I'm most concerned about the incestuous relationship between the federal reserve and wall street uh it has been addressed by many commentators, but I think it's it's a real problem. Uh, as you know, the Federal Reserve is not really a public body. It's the instrumentality of the banks and the mega banks primarily. And by keeping their interest rates down around 0%, they've fed the uh, <coughs> insatiable appetite of Wall Street uh, for cheap money, uh, which in turn has enabled Wall Street to maintain its, its power and ultimately skim uh, the best of our economy uh, off before we have that trickle-down uh, effect that, that comes, perhaps. But uh, yeah, I, I think Wall Street is as much a danger 
to our liberty today as big government. I, I'm really concerned about it, the exploitation of the middle class that has come out of that sort of thing. And I think Congress needs to assert some degree of accountability over the Federal Reserve. And uh, I'm, yeah, I don't know that we can go back to Glass-Steagall, but uh, we need something like that to put banks back into their place, maybe break them up, put them back into banking, let the in, uh, investment corporations, the biggies, do the investment, but keep our banks in banking. I think that's been one of the biggest problems we had since Glass-Steagall was uh, disposed of back in the 1990s. Right, right. That um, that was uh, created after the Great Depression, and right. it seemed to work well until we decided to get rid of it. And now, exactly. if you were a congressperson in 2008, would you have voted for those bailouts? Uh, no, I don't think I would have. I really got irritated at that time when all the congressmen and senators wanted to get, had to go running back to Washington so they could vote on that bailout. I think while it may have been a painful experience, we, our economy would be doing a lot better if we had let some of the biggies go down, be split up. They wouldn't have disappeared, uh, but they would have been split up, bought off uh, by smaller banks in this case. And I think banks, the, the mega banks, are the biggest part of the problem, but there are plenty of other mega corporations, financials and whatnot that are contribute to the problem as well. Yeah, imagine if some of the smaller banks might have bought them up and we had actually more competition. Now, right. you did mention Trump there. He proposed stop and frisk for the entire nation. And so just touching on the justice system, and what do you think needs to be changed in the justice system? I mean, in some quick points, and should we have stop and frisk for the entire country? I, I don't think we need that. We do need, we need to look closely at... Uh, the policies of our law enforcement agencies. I, I'm a retired military officer, and I've worked with rules of engagement during my time in the military. Military is very much concerned about how we utilize our lethal force, and, and I think our law enforcement uh, organizations throughout the country need to look closely at that, keeping in mind the sensitivities uh, in race relations and that sort of thing. It's a very complex problem. I don't want to give any quick little, sure. you know, 25 words or less solutions to that problem, but we need to look at that uh, very closely and uh, make sure that our policies and our uh, regulations regarding the use of lethal force are fair and, and that we purge racial issues to the extent that we can from uh, the processes there that uh, uh, police use. They're, they're dealing with, uh, you know, the problems they run into having to to deal with the, the worst perpetrators that we have in the country on a daily basis can, can make them pretty callous sometimes. But they need to they need to abide by those regulations. As I say, in the military, we have the rules of engagement, and, and as I understand from my law enforcement people, they have their policies, but they're a little different. For instance, just take for instance, their policies have heretofore been to empty an entire clip into a perpetrator if they you know, have a justification to shoot in the first place. That's not a good policy. Uh, I think we need to relook some some of those kinds of things. Sure, but sure. I don't want to get bogged down in that. There are other issues I'm sure you want to talk about. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And since you're a All veteran, right. uh, let me ask you about um, our foreign policy um, sure. and our military uh, spending or just military in general. Um, what are some of the things that, you know, we're doing wrong that we should be doing better? Well, what some of the things we have done wrong, I, frankly, I'm not a big fan of Obama, but he has improved on his predecessors uh, in that we have, a, in effect, a de facto containment policy for the Middle East and Northern Africa, which is what I think we need. No deployments, vast deployments of U.S. combat forces in a in a uh, environment uh, which you'd have to say is a, a hostile cultural environment for our people. And Essentially, when we send large numbers of troops into Islamic cultures, we create more problems than we resolve. No matter how powerful we are, we create more problems. We end up recruiting for al-Qaeda and ISIS when we do that. I know that firsthand. So we've got to look at uh, a containment policy which explicitly and coherently deals with this issue and speaks to the emphasizing advisors and trainers in host countries uh, rather than deployments of we call them boots on the ground or 
combat forces in those countries. And uh, I think we're moving in that direction, but I'd like to see more coherence in that, in how we do that, in the policy that we have. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of mission creep. I mean, you know, we oh, were... Did. Yeah. Um, now, what branch of the military were you in, sir? I, uh, Army, and I was privileged to wear a Green Beret for a while, but I'm, I'm unique. I'm not a warrior. I was a JAG officer, a military lawyer, uh, who advised some special operations forces. I was I served with Special Action Force Asia under the first Special Forces Group in uh, back between 1968 and 71. Uh, we had some interesting issues, to say the least, but uh, our people did a good job. But we were, you know, we were the, what we call the quiet professionals back there to the side. And I think we need to exercise that capability that we have, special ops capability, and kind of leave the deployments of conventional combat forces for the big ones, uh, the big wars, and not try to utilize them to put out the little fires here and there. Absolutely. And now what about small, mid-sized business? Um, mm -hmm. what, we, what could we help to improve the environment for small, mid-sized businesses, new entrepreneurship? That's a very, very good question. I think there we need to look again at the regulations. Regulations may be appropriate for the big guys on Wall Street are not appropriate, and they're a real problem for smaller businesses on Main Street. Again, I know from personal experience. I ran a restaurant for a short period of time and other businesses, and uh, we need to make sure that the folks down at own Main Street, Main Street level, have minimum regulations to encumber them when they're trying to get cranked up and deal with uh, the issues they have to as, as entrepreneurs. But the big guys on Wall Street, you know, when they talk about uh, not being regulated, uh, given what they are and uh, their size and the vulnerability of our people to their exploitation we need regulations at the wall street level i think we need to think in terms of of uh, breaking up the big banks for instance uh, i sound like elizabeth warren i know that uh, i'm not a liberal but in some ways and even bernie sanders sometimes but I, i'm certainly not a, a socialist by any stretch but i think the big guys do need regulations the little guys don't yeah, and that's about building consensus. So let me read another paragraph on your website, uh, sure. rudybarnesforcongress.com. I will emphasize a politics of re reconciliation without the toxic burden of party loyalty. My decisions mm -hmm. will be based on balancing our individual rights with providing for the common good that requires political independence that neither of my opponents can bring to Congress. Uh, my standards of legitimacy are based on the greatest commandment to love God and our neighbors as ourselves. So let me ask you this. If um, mm -hmm. right now you mentioned Bernie Sanders, he was one of the few independents that have ever been elected to Congress. Uh, and you're talking about competition. Well, we have a duopoly without much competition. What kind of message right. would that send uh, selecting someone such as yourself, an independent uh, a candidate from the American Party to Congress this year? Well, we are trying. The American Party has as one of its themes to find common ground, uh, to enable it to break up uh, what would would be a gridlock situation with two parties. I think that's essential. I, I might add that I was a, a United Methodist pastor for 12 years, and my study and my faith uh, it makes me. I'm really a maverick within my faith. I'm not. I'm. Don't confuse me with a typical Christian evangelical who supports Trump. I'm not there. I, I really feel strongly about uh, the uh, the go you know the golden rule, simple as that, or what we call the greatest commandment, which Jews, Christians, and Muslims all agree uh, is at the foundation of their faith: the loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. And that means everybody. The problem is in implementing it is is being able to love everybody. When you got bad guys running around the world trying to take advantage of others, if you love others, you got to do something about them. And sometimes that means sticking them into jail, sometimes it means putting them away permanently. So, you know, it's a difficult job, but that the, I think it's absolutely essential that we think in terms of reconciliation uh, among different religions, uh, uh, different races. I mean, today, I, I just don't recall having seen so much hostility, other than maybe in the 60s. Uh, but uh, we've got to do something about that, uh, or we're going to come apart at the seams. I'm really concerned about it, and I think that the principle of reconciliation is absolutely essential. We've got to look at that and put that as a priority.
All right. It, what about the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership? I know it's over 2,000 pages. Maybe you haven't had the time to read it yet. No, But I, do you I think haven't. you would support it? If, if we're looking at the fundamental contest between free trade and tariffs, I favor free trade. But it's not as simple as that. I know there are certain things we've got to deal with to make sure that the scales are balanced, and it does get very complex. But when people start talking about setting up tariffs and taxes to protect American business, I, we're, we're back to the 1930s, the 20s, 30s, when you know what happens. We, we set them up to protect ourselves, and then the other countries do the same, and everybody goes down downhill with that. So we've, I think we need to think in terms of free, uh, free trade, but ensuring that when we engage in these treaties or enter into these treaties, that they're balanced. If they were pure free trade, it'd be one thing, but they aren't. And uh, I, I wish I were that familiar with the details of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but I'm not. I know there are some problems with it that need to be worked out, and I figured I'd just say that if I get elected, I'm going to make sure I get on top of that in a hurry. All right, and uh, let's see, election reform. Do you, would you support score voting? Are you familiar with what score voting is? Score voting, is that, uh, well, what, explain it briefly. It's like rank voting, but basically you can um, select uh, your like top three or so candidates. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. I would select this person as my first choice, this person as my yeah. second or third, et cetera. Yeah, I wrote, I've got an MPA. I earned it back in the... Before I went on, uh, served on Columbia City Council, and uh, we were in the throes of uh, we had no minority representation, and we needed to do something that would enable us to do that. And uh, my focus then was on a mix of at large and single member districts. But I remember seeing uh, in in my research uh, some things about that type of voting and how it worked. I, I don't have any personal experience with systems that that use that method, so I really don't know. The practical matter how practical it is, but I think we need to explore all kinds of means of, of you know, electing our officials, including that. I, I think, unfortunately, the single-member district approach and the gerrymandering that has come out of that has done far more harm to our our politics than I think most people can realize. And it's it's a kind of a permanent thing. It is institutionalized racism. I know down in the South and I, I guess other places as well. It's going to take a long time, but we've got to work our way back to a system where politicians need to seek the support of black and white people and people of other religions as well if we're going to expect uh, to have any kind of reconciliation uh, in our political product. Okay, yeah, I just want to throw that out there for for you and our listeners. Just to, you know, yep. that's something that not, not many people have heard of. But yeah, look, I encourage people to look that up. Who are some of your favorite past or present people, sir? Past and present. Or good people. question. We were just thinking of uh, Senator Duxon. Uh, think of him from North Carolina. He was a a great guy. Sam Nunn always impressed me. These are people who could cross the aisle very easily and and were respected by folks on both sides, both party lines. We just don't have people like that anymore, and uh, we need those kind of folks. We don't have to compromise our ideals to do that. We just need to relearn the art of compromise and to respect the views of other folks without sacrificing ideals. I, I, you know, I practiced law now for 49 years, and uh, adv advocacy of <laughs> a position is something I feel very comfortable with, but we can do it in the law profession in an agreeable way. Uh, but it seems like so many of our people ha have become hostile toward those who have differing views or opinions, and, and that's, that's not a good thing. All right. So um, in wrapping up here, I mean, some people might be a Hillary supporter. Others might be a Trump supporter, and that's at the presidential level. Tonight there's going to be the final presidential debate, you know, uh, with the major candidates. However, at the congressional level, I would say there's – um, the opportunity, at least, for a lot less um, division. And because at the congressional level, there's a buffer of 435 members of the House of Representatives. And but zero, uh, as I understand, is zero independence in the House. None. Zero independence in the Senate. In the House, so. The Senate, but none in the House, and that's a problem. Uh, that's right. I think, you know, we need more independence. That's why, as an American member of the American Party, 
I'm still an independent. I'm a member of the American Party, but I'm promoting independent congressmen. And I think that's that's what we need to break up this gridlock and to, as European parliaments are accustomed to doing, you have a, a more fluid uh, legislative process and uh, when, you, when you do that. But I, I don't think we're very close to that. I think our people are far too comfortable limiting themselves to two parties. I've talked to any number of people during the campaign, and I'm, I'm rather discouraged, uh, unfortunately, about their willingness to even con- seriously consider a third-party candidate. They say, oh, I'm throwing away my vote. If uh, I vote for a third-party candidate, and I go in to explain to him, no, you're not. You're sending a message, and you're not supporting the other po- folks uh, when you're voting for a third party. But folks have a very difficult time understanding that. So we've got a we've got a challenge. Well, Rudy, uh, let me give you a, a, just a quick message of hope here. I mean, according to all the Gallup polls, at least, um, or in other polls, McClatchy and et cetera, most people would not elect, re-elect their current Congress people. And Congress has had, like, lower than a 20% approval rating for over the last 10 years. The majority of registered voters are independent and uh, at 42%, Democrat at 29%, Republican at 26%. And I can understand their argument about the lesser of two evils at the presidential mm-hmm. level, like a vote for someone is uh, not if, if you vote for a third party, then you're essentially voting for one of the other two. However, at the congressional level, that that argument doesn't hold up as much because you are just one person in a body of 435 people. So they, there's more likely a chance that if you're going to take a risk, in other words, take it a risk take a risk at the uh, House of Representatives. Uh, Our founders designed it that way on purpose to be the least resistant, most peaceful, and quickest path to reform in our democratically elected republic. Um, You know, it's elected every two years. So if you want to vote your conscience, do it at the House of Representatives, even if you're not going to do it at the presidential level. And maybe that's something we all can agree on. Now, is there any final words of wisdom for our audience and for your possible... um, you know, Just voters. Close your heart and try to avoid choosing the lesser of two evils. Because when you do, you're still voting for evil. Just remember that you can vote for a third-party candidate without supporting the opposition, and you'll be voting for someone you can truly support. That's uh, all I could say for for folks across the country. And of course, in my district, I get very personal about it. <laughs> but we, for other folks, consider those third-party candidates. That's what I would say. Yeah, and it's going to start with like two or three or four, and then two years from then it might grow to ten. I mean, we are the only party, I mean, the only country that has a two-party system in the... uh, George Washington, George Washington warned us about it. Others have too, but there we are. We've got this this mess as a result, so we've got to do something to change it, Thomas. And I do thank you for joining us. I would say to our listeners, even if you're not in the 5th District in South Carolina, i you know, the Koch brothers are contributing all across the country in congressional races because they know Congress is where it's at. They're not even, and they're billionaires, by the way, that involve yep. themselves in the politics. But they, they know the presidential election is, uh, you know, president isn't the only branch of um, government. And so Congress is where it's really at. And so good to talk with you today, Rudy. We do appreciate your time today, and, and we appreciate most of all giving the voters an additional option so you're going to be in position you know when that wave of reform does come come around whether it's this year or two years from now or or whenever we appreciate it very much sir thank you for calling thomas appreciate that all right take care good to talk with you today thanks bye-bye